A sovereign selection, Saul meets Samuel. Now, as you recall from chapter 8, last week, we discovered that the Israelites were getting very tired of the rule of these uh, temporary judges that God was setting over them. And they wanted to change. Samuel was getting old, and they reminded him of that. And his sons were in certainly no position at all to follow in his footsteps. Samuel was their religious leader and their governmental leader, but they didn't like that anymore. They wanted a king just like all the other lands around them. So they demanded that. Now, Pastor Jeremy posed a very good question in his sermon title last week, Is God Enough? And their answer was what? No, emphatically no. They wanted a king to rule over them. And even though Samuel warned them of all the negative circumstances that would come their way as a result of that, what it would cost them, they still demanded it. So when Samuel went to the Lord and told him, the Lord said, go ahead, give it to them. Give them what they want. Remember, it's not you they're rejecting, it's me. So, Jeremy reminded us of this important truth. Sometimes God gives us what we want to show us that God can show us what we actually need. It reminded me of a picture I saw on the internet last night um, of a cat that was all wrapped up in yarn. Cats love yarn, don't they? And he was playing with it so much, what he wanted, it actually wrapped him up so he couldn't go anywhere. It's what he wanted, but it's not what he needed. Now in chapter 9, we pick up the prelude to this historic governmental change in Israel. I'm going to call it Israel's Great Reset. So this story shows us this very important testament of God's divine providence, showing us how God can transform ordinary circumstances for his extraordinary purposes. His plan often unfolds in ways and through people that we least expect, showing that his, his sovereignty and his ability to use every situation out there for his glory, not ours. So we begin with the first section, the search for lost stock. Verse 1, there was a man of Benjamin whose name was Kish, the son of Abiel, the son of Zeror, the son of Becherath, the son of Aphia, a Benjaminite, a man of wealth. And he had a son whose name was Saul, a handsome young man. There was not a man among the people of Israel more handsome than he. From his shoulders upward, he was taller than any of the people. So we are introduced to Saul here for the first time. He's from the tribe of Benjamin, which is indeed the smallest tribe in Israel. He's the son of Kish, and Kish is a man of wealth. So physically speaking, Saul is all the man you would ever want to be your leader. A standout, not only by his height, and in all the movies you see about Saul and, uh, and David, you never see a guy that's head and shoulders above everybody else as an actor in there. This guy must have been huge. Not only by his height, but by his attractiveness. Can you imagine saying, there's no one more handsome in all of America than so-and-so? Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Try to, try to believe that, right? So outwardly, he's the man you would expect as a natural leader. But spoiler alert... In just seven chapters, Samuel is going to hear from God that he is going to quash that human standard for qualification for leadership when God sends him to go anoint the second king of Israel, King David. And he goes to Jesse's house and he sees Eliab. He's the, he's the oldest. He's the biggest. He's obviously the one that's most fit for leadership. And what does God say? He says, no, Samuel, it's not him. God looks on the outward appearance, but, excuse me, man looks on the outward appearance, let's get this right, but God looks on the heart. God looks on the heart. Which leads us to our first teaching point. Qualification for leadership is internal, not external. You see, in any ministry calling, 
God employs hearts that are, first of all, pure before him, pliable, teachable, humble. Most, if not all, ministry leaders have some physical weakness, have some deficiency, whether they want to admit it or not, which keeps us trusting in God's sufficiency for the work he's called us to do. So physical strength and glamour may have their place some, somewhere in the kingdom of God, and I'm sure he uses that thing, but the heart is what's important, what's inside. Friday, I spoke at my former church at a memorial service for a single missionary gal that served with Wycliffe. Mary was from a poor Bellingham family. She was brought to uh, the Sunday school there at Rome, where I pastored. Not glamorous outwardly, not an effervescent personality, not something that, someone that you would be attracted to, but her heart was for the Lord. And she wanted to bring the Word of God to lost tribes that never had the Word of God. And so she was called to Brazil to help translate uh, the Bible into the Pomari tribe. And after faithfully serving God for almost 50 years with Wycliffe, she returned to the church that I later came to pastor. You know, we hear it at funerals all the time. Their inner joy and their inner relationship with Jesus Christ just shines through all the external physical deficiencies. And it's the love, it's the heart that shines through, in the, especially in those latter days. You think of Saul here. In Israel, this, this tall, dark, handsome man was sent on a quest that had a very unique ending to it, didn't it? Verse 3. Now the donkeys of Kish, Saul's father, were lost. So Kish said to Saul, his son, Take one of the young men with you and arise. Go and look for the donkeys. And he passed through the hill country of Ephraim and passed through the land of Shalashah, and they did not find them there. And they passed through the land of Sha'alim, but they were not there. Then they passed through the land of Benjamin, but did not find them. And when they came to the land of Zuf, Saul said to his servant who was with him, Come, let's go back, lest my father cease to care about the donkeys and become more anxious about us. So anyone that's grown up on a farm or near livestock knows that those animals don't respect fences, right? They don't expect their, respect their limitations. And I remember as a teenager... Uh, growing up on the Squalicum Lake Road, we had a, a, a flock of sheep that knew every weak spot in the fence. So we were always out chasing them down, trying to gather them back up and head them back in. But my worst experience is when we had a hired bull on our property, and he got out, and he headed down our long driveway and out to the road, and he was heading towards Lake Watcom. And I was home alone. And it was a hot July day. I still remember it so well. And it was my job to get ahead of that bull and round him up and get him back into our property. It was no fun. It's no fun. But think about these guys. They've been out in the road, out in the road, out in the country for three days, and now they're getting hungry. Uh, covered a lot of miles with no luck. Well, obviously, there's no luck involved in this circumstance, as we'll see here, because those, those animals, those donkeys, were already on their way home, sovereignly, providentially led by the hand of God back to the farm. Isn't that interesting? You see, he was only using them to bring about a, a providential encounter between Samuel, the judge, and the new king of Israel, the future king of Israel, Saul. So we know that God now can transform ordinary circumstances for his extraordinary purposes. God is utilizing this opportunity. And God's plan, as I said before, often unfolds in ways that we least expect and through animals even, 
that uh, he can use for his glory. Think about those diversions in your own life journey that God has used, those donkeys that you chased, uh, that God used to set you on a whole new path with a whole new purpose for your life. Where did your missing donkeys lead you? As a Christian teenager, uh, I had a strong interest in car styling. The new styles in those cars every fall just excited me. That was back when they had new styles every single year, instead of the mundane things that keep repeating, repeating. So that interest excited me to the point where I entered an annual model car competition sponsored by General Motors. And I entered it three years in a row with 112 scale model cars that I built out of wood. I designed them myself and built them out of wood and submitted them each year. And I wanted to be a car designer for General Motors and make lots of money and support missionaries, of course. <laughs> of course. But uh, my, my dream actually came a little closer one day when I found out that I won the first in state award for my model car at the age of 15. So that brought me a little bit closer to attaining my goal. And it also propelled me to try at age 16 for my one final entry to win the scholarship that would get me into the U of Dub and, and so forth. But God slammed that door shut so clearly, he made it very clear, no, this is not gonna be your profession, Scott. So my, when my pastor found out about this, he said, why don't you try Multnomah for at least one year and see what God has for you there? So I did, and I'm so glad I did, because it turned my whole life around. Uh, I, God confirmed my call to ministry there. He led me to my future wife, for which I am eternally grateful, and also helped prepare me for the ministry that lay ahead. My lost donkey search led to a very fulfilling life of missions and pastoring. So what's your story of God's sovereign interventions in your life? Think of your own conversion testimony that has brought you to this place at this moment in your life. How did you get here? Have you ever thought about all the diversions, all the interactions of God in your life? I, uh, I reviewed the places in my life where God clearly redirected me, and I wrote them down in a book that my middle daughter published for me, because it shows all the different intersections of God that led me to this point in my life, and I wanted to record them for my children and their children to make sure that they followed God and watch for those times when he would lead them, even on paths that they didn't want to go on. Now next we have the servant's suggestion, verses 6 through 10. So Saul's ready to give up the search, but his servant says no. He said to him, Behold, there is a man of God in this city, and he is a man who is held in high honor. All that he says comes true. So now let's go there. Perhaps he can tell us the way we should go. And then Saul said to his servant, But if we go, what can we bring the man? For the bread in our sacks is gone, and there is no present to bring to the man of God. What do we have? And the servant answered Saul again, Well, here, I have with me a quarter of a shekel of silver, and I will give it to the man of God to tell us our way. Now, formerly in Israel, when a man went to inquire of God, he said, come, let's go to the seer. For today's prophet was formerly called a seer. And God said to his servant, and Saul said to his servant, well said, let's go. So they went to the city where the man of God was. Now, apparently, Zuf is Samuel's ancestral land, and Saul's very smart servant says that the local seer could help them. Now let's unwrap this little section here just a little bit more. Isn't it interesting that the servant knew of Samuel, 
but Saul seems to have no knowledge of it. And he, he doesn't recognize him when he actually does see him. Saul hadn't planned very well ahead, did he? He didn't know he was going to be gone for three days, but they ran out of food, and he ran out of enough money to be able to buy food. And uh, thankfully, the servant has the necessary pocket change to offer the seer for his prophetic service, which was common to do back then. Aren't you glad that we don't have to tip Jeremy or Alex every time you need some counsel from him? I've got a quarter in my pocket here, Jeremy. Would that help? <laughs> So they don't, we don't do that anymore. But he also knows that God speaks through this man because his predictions all come true, as we learned back in chapter 3, verse 19, where it says, The Lord was with him, and let none of his words fall to the ground. But Saul only wants a fortune teller to tell him where the donkeys are. If Saul had any spiritual inclination in his life at all, he would realize what an opportunity lie right here, right here in this town, to go and actually talk to the seer, the man who talks with God, a man who can give him insight for his life, give him some direction for his life instead of just his donkeys. But sadly, they took precedence over any spiritual refreshment that he might have gotten from Saul. Teaching point number two... Prioritize the spiritual dimensions of life and the physical needs will align themselves. It kind of sounds like Matthew 6.33, doesn't it? But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. And in the context of Matthew 6, all those things are all the physical needs of life, food, clothing, and shelter. You seek God, he'll give them to you. And the writer here inserts in the text, a parenthetical clarification regarding a prophet which dispels any mystical connotations of the word seer. The Hebrew word for seer is ra'ah. It means to see, to advise, to discern. And interestingly, exactly the same word also means vulture or eagle. Uh, what's the connection here? What do these birds do as they are soaring up in those updrafts up there? What are they doing? They're seeing. They're watching for carrion down on the, on the ground, right? Long vision with eagle eyes. So the prophets are seeing what God clearly reveals to them, and they spoke what they saw. They revealed it. So their position in Israel was really crucial for the spiritual growth of the people because they were speaking what they heard and saw from God himself. If they were willing to obey what the prophets were saying, they would live. If they rejected it, they would die. And it's, it's so clear. They didn't, Israelites didn't often like to hear what the prophets had to say, and many of them were killed, as Jesus said. So God had brought Saul and his servant the, to the hometown of a man who could see where those donkeys were. And Saul didn't know this, but providentially his servant did. Isn't that interesting? I love how God brings people together, one in need of the other. This, this servant is golden for Saul. Because it's his words that actually turn this whole thing around into another opportunity for God's sovereignty to work its will out. Teaching point number three, your choice of companions in life will directly impact your life's path. Think of your best companions, your best friends, your life partner. What a difference they have made in your life. Make sure that your friends are those upon whom you can lean for help, encouragement, not just friendship, but guidance, commitment to truth. And make sure that you are that kind of friend yourself, and God will bless. Next, we come to the, uh, the site of Samuel, the seer, verse 11. 
As they went up the hill to the city, they met young women coming out to draw water and said to them, Is the seer here? And they answered, He is. Behold, he's just ahead of you. Hurry! He has come just now to the city because the people have a sacrifice today on the high place. And as soon as you enter the city, you will find him before he goes up to the high place to eat. For the people will not eat until he comes, since he must bless the sacrifice. Afterward, those who are invited to eat will eat. Now go up, for you will meet him immediately. So they went up to the city, and as they were entering the city, they saw Samuel coming out toward them on his way up to the high place. So it just so happened that Samuel had just happened to arrive back in town from his circuit, and Saul just happened to arrive there on the day when they were going to have a sacrifice in the high place. And there's also a a feast to be had up there on the hill with uh, a limited number of guests. About 30 men were, were invited, probably the councilmen of the city. And the whole ceremony cannot begin until Samuel arrives to bless the sacrifice. So even though those young ladies may have wanted to stay and chat with this tall, dark, handsome stranger, um, they said, hurry, you can catch him. And that was very wise for them. God directed them. <clears throat> and who should just happen to be exiting the city as these two men were entering the city? Teaching point number four. There are no accidental encounters in life that God has no purpose for. You see, God's timing is always right. I don't even like the word accident or that phrase that I used four times purposefully, it just so happened. No, these are all providential divine interventions. Sometimes inconvenient interruptions that we don't like from our perspective but appointments with a purpose designed by God. And they happen everywhere. They can happen at a gas station while you're filling up your your car and you start chatting chatting with someone else about their car. It happened to me after Melva's service the other day. It can happen in a restaurant as you just happen to sit next to somebody that's overhearing your conversation and you start talking. It can happen as you're hiking up in the mountains. It happens to us all the time to interact with people that we meet. And it can happen right here in church as God providentially seats you next to someone that may just need a word from you, just a word of encouragement. It happens while we're walking our dog. You wouldn't believe how many opportunities you get to talk with people that have a dog too, you know? And so suddenly you have something in common and then the conversation can go anywhere that God leads it if you're open to that. So even a brief conversation can turn someone's attention to Jesus because God has prepared their hearts to listen. You may not know that at the time that you connect, but God does. So never minimize what seem like chance encounters. And in those opportunities, just ask, what does God have for me here? Lord, what do you, what do you, how do you want to use me here? What shall I say? Think of how God used those young women in this story. They knew all the details that Saul needed to know in order to propel him directly into the path of Samuel. Second, or fourth section, the salvation plan shown to Samuel. Verse 15, now the day before Saul came, the Lord had revealed to Samuel, tomorrow about this time, I will send to you a man from the land of Benjamin, and you shall anoint him to be prince or ruler over my people Israel. He shall save my people from the hand of the Philistines, for I have seen, and the Septuagint adds here, the affliction of my people, because their cry has come to me. And when Samuel saw Saul, the Lord told him, Here is the man of whom I spoke to you. He it is who shall restrain or rule my people. So this anointing was to be a very special dedication 
of Saul for a very high calling that God had in mind for him. Anointing meant that it had sort of a messianic role, very similar to another chosen vessel of God about 400 years earlier back in Egypt. And the the wording here almost sounds the same, doesn't it, as back in Exodus chapter 3, where Moses heard the words from the burning bush. I have surely seen the affliction of my people in Egypt, and I've heard their cry, and I have come down to deliver them, and it's going to be through you, Moses. So if Israel's deliverance through a king would actually have to wait another 40 years until their second king is anointed, and ultimately another 1,000 years until the ultimate Messiah comes to pay the price for man's sin, to redeem us. In verse 17, the phrase the Lord told him is literally the God the Lord spoke into his ear, which is an idiom for saying to pull back the headdress so that you can whisper directly into the ear. So even though God gave such short notice to Samuel, Samuel was nevertheless listening and watching. Kind of harks back to those first chapters, doesn't it? Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening when he was just a little boy. This, uh, this next section, I think I left off uh, number five, the serious surprise for Saul. Verse 18, then Saul approached Samuel in the gate and said, tell me, where is the house of the seer? The Samuel answered Saul, I'm the seer. Go up before me to the high place, for today you shall eat with me, and in the morning I will let you go and will tell you all that is on your mind. As for your donkeys that were lost three days ago, don't set your mind on them, for they have been found. And for whom is all that is desirable in Israel? Is it not for you and for all your father's house? Such a strange greeting. So Saul only wanted to find the seer to tell him where to find the stock, not to put his name on the ballot for king. And after he tells Saul that his donkeys are found, he asks these two interesting questions that just throw Saul off balance here. And for whom is all that is desirable in Israel? Is it not for you and for all your father's house? What is he saying there? He's saying that all of Israel wants a king, and you are that man. All of Israel's hope lies on your shoulders. You know, it's not what Saul was expecting, and it's not what he wanted to hear. So in this very first conversation with Samuel lies a hint of what will eventually topple Saul's reign. That is his feeling of inferiority, his lack of faith in God's word, and his vacillation between those feelings and his commitment to the calling that he gets. And Saul answered, Am I not a Benjaminite from the least of the tribes of Israel? And is not my clan the humblest of all the clans of the tribe of Benjamin? Why then have you spoken to me in this way? Now, many think this sounds like humility, but I think it's more like, come on, man, don't you know your facts? I'm a nobody, and I want it to stay that way. You know, he was right about the Benjaminites. They were the smallest tribe in Israel. They were almost totally wiped out by their fellow Israelites. In Judges 19 to 21, one of the worst chapters in all of Israel's history, because of their horrible immorality. But was Saul's clan the humblest? No, it was probably one of the wealthiest. Saul was already trying to disqualify himself. Isn't this interesting? Showing his weak character and actually stretching the truth. But would he change? Would he come to yield himself entirely to God's will? I found this interesting quote. In ancient literature, character is more or less fixed. 
People do not really change over the course of their lifetimes. The manner in which they are introduced often functions as a shorthand summary of their life. And I think that's true for Saul. Teaching point number five. When God gives an assignment, he equips us for it. See, by his grace, his strength is perfected in our weakness. 2 Corinthians 12, 9 is is my life's verse. So never assume in your weakest moments that you are flying solo, that God's nowhere around. And never assume in your strongest moments where you feel the most confident that you can handle this on your own. See, God always wants us to trust in his strength so that who gets the glory? So that he always gets the glory in all these circumstances. Saul will learn the hard way that no matter who sits on earthly thrones, God has never left his. Then, verse 22, Samuel took Saul and his young man, brought them into the hall, and gave them a place at the head of those who had been invited, who were about 30 persons. And Samuel said to the cook, Bring the portion I gave you, of which I said to you, put it aside. So the cook took up the leg and what was on it and set them before Saul. And Samuel said, See what was kept is set before you. Eat, because it was kept for you until the hour appointed that you might eat with the guests. So Samuel had clearly prearranged with the maitre d' of this feast to have the right shoulder of mutton which is normally served to the priest, set aside just for this special guest. And he had also arranged to make sure that there were two empty places next to him at the head table. So this was a double honor for these two dusty guys that had just blown into town that no one else knew. And Samuel is making a huge social statement here as to the importance of these men far more important than anyone else sitting around that table. Perhaps Samuel was testing uh, Saul's character to see how he would respond to this high honor that was set before him. But it simply says, so Saul ate with Samuel that day. Don't you wish it had been filled out just a little bit more here to know more about what happened? (sighs) And when they came down from the high place into the city, a bed was spread for Saul on the roof, and he lay down to sleep. So even, on, even this is another honor, to sleep in Samuel's guest room up on the roof. Then at the break of dawn, Samuel called to Saul on the roof, Up, then I may send you on your way. So Saul arose, and both he and Samuel went out into the street. And as they were going down to the outskirts of the city, Samuel said to Saul, Tell the servant to pass on before us, and then, and when he has passed on, stop here for yourself for a while, that I may make known to you the word of God. So the seer has seen and now must say what he knows to communicate. Samuel is clearly communicating to Saul that he is hearing from God. This whole king thing is not Samuel's idea, it's God's idea. Israel was about to transition from a nation ruled by judges who hopefully were in tune with God, following him, to a monarch who must be in tune with God to follow God's will in his leadership. And next week, the great reset begins with Saul as their new monarch. And that's when something amazing happens to this 30-year-old man that sets him up for success if he will trust God. So what should our response be to this? Well, first of all, relating to life's circumstances, I want to encourage you to watch for God at work in your life in all life circumstances because he is sovereignly aligning people and opportunities to do things that you may not expect. He can use painful crises. He can use unplanned encounters to accomplish his eternal purposes. 
So don't despise or ignore his promptings and his interventions. They are not accidents. They are opportunities to trust his sovereign leadership in his life and your life. God is always at work. The second one is a lot harder one to deal with because it really comes down to the circumstances in which we live today. Uh, We must believe with full confidence that no matter who sits on earthly thrones, God always rules the universe. No leader, regardless of how competent or incompetent, can ever overrule God's plan. And how important it is for us as God's people to stay informed as to what's happening in the world today and see how it's lining up with Bible prophecy. What happened in Israel just, was it yesterday, the day before, between them and Iran? Are we not in the last days of the last days? The world is right on the edge, and the world is right where God planned it to be. It all fits into his calendar. So stay informed, my friends. You know, there's an unelected world council, oligarchs, if you want to call them that, that have assumed godlike power allegedly to save Mother Earth. And you know how they're going to do it? By destroying humanity. Isn't that weird? They're just blatantly saying it practically these days. And they are creating fear in order to gain control of human hearts. They've already tested it with a certain disease a few years ago, or virus. And they're setting up a global kingdom in preparation for the appearance of the Antichrist before the rapture. Now, we as Christians are not watching for Antichrist. We're watching for Jesus Christ and his return. And they are racing towards the greatest global reset since the Tower of Babel. They believe they will rule the earth, and they're planning for that. And won't they be surprised someday to find out what their real end is and that they've been following the wrong God and to find out that they've just been pawns because the Apostle John predicted all of this 2,000 years ago and what you're seeing unfold today. So my friends, don't fear them. Let's fear God, which is kind of my theme for the men's dinner in a couple of weeks. Have faith that his word is coming true every single passing day. And here's the important thing. Make sure that your life is surrendered to Jesus Christ, who gave his life for you, that you might be his child forever, that he might work his will out through you and use you for his eternal purposes. Don't risk eternity for the sake of chasing lost donkeys that are just diversions in your life. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you so much that you are God. There is no one that can dethrone you. You have things planned that we may not know of, that we may not like, that are painful, but it all is fitting into what you have designed from eternity past And that brings us, Lord, to the very, very important question of where does our faith lie? What are we chasing after? Help us, Lord, to let go of those things that will not matter in eternity and to be watching for you to use us in those little moments of life when you want to bring life to someone that needs it. So bless, Lord, this this story, these words, that they may rest in our heart and change us as we go from here today. In Jesus' name, amen.